section twenty three of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eight pompey part three it was while lying in his camp at jericho planning an expedition against the nebutian arabs of petra that pompey received the news that mithridates was dead the old king had tried too long the patience of his sons and his soldiers wearied of his wholesale executions and his wild plans for directing impossible expeditions against italy they had risen against him and he had been forced to save himself from murder by committing suicide his son and successor pharnaces sent his embalmed body to pompey who shocked at the unfilial act ordered it to be laid in the family sepulchre of the kings of pontus at sinope the next year b c sixty two when all opposition in the east had been beaten down was devoted to the delimitation and organization of the new provinces which pompey had added to the empire syria cilicia and bithynia pontus it is universally agreed that the settlement was carried out in a wise generous and statesmanlike way even dr mommsen acknowledges that though conducted primarily in the interest of rome secondarily in that of the provincials it was comparatively commendable the conversion of the chief states into provinces the better regulation of the eastern frontier the establishment of a single and strong government were full of blessings alike for the rulers and the ruled the name of pompey always remained popular in the east fifteen years later when he was engaged in his great civil war with caesar he found the asiatic provinces perfectly loyal and drew from them his most important resources his dealings alike with the petty princes and the hellenized cities were wise and upright but he set his mark most notably on the land by the great number of towns which he founded or restored almost without exception his new colonies proved successful their sites were well chosen their constitutions wisely framed they grew and flourished indeed to pompey more than to any other single person must the first beginnings of civil life in many parts of eastern asia minor be ascribed before him towns in the pontic inland and certain other districts were almost non-existent even the places in cilicia peopled with reclaimed pirates did well in short he was in the east almost as great a founder and organizer as caesar in the west though his work in this direction has been well-nigh forgotten in the winter of sixty two pompey had at last completed his long and laborious task and set out on his homeward way bearing his enormous spoils and with his victorious legions at his back of the stir and disquiet that his approach produced we have already written while dealing with crassus and cato but when the new sulla as his disloyal critics chose to call him landed at brundisium he showed no intention of marching on the city or starting a proscription he behaved like a victorious general of the good old days duly disbanded his soldiery and came up to rome unarmed to receive as he supposed the thanks and the credit that were most certainly due to him it was an astonishing piece of civic virtue if we considered the temptations to a man of ambition if he had chosen to stretch forth his hand and ask for supreme power it would undoubtedly have been within his grasp the democrats were cowed by the failure of the catalinian conspiracy the optimates had no army to oppose to the victorious legions of the east but the crown and the sceptre were not his desire he had no notion of upsetting the republic in which he only desired to be the first citizen it is absurd to say with mommsen that fortune never did more for any mortal than for pompey but on those who lack courage the gods lavish all things in vain is it the duty of every capable man to snatch at a tyranny and why should pompey be called a coward for refusing to subvert the immemorial constitution of rome he had no political schemes to work out no great program of reform to broach all that he asked 
was to be the first servant of the state the man to whom practical tasks of first-rate importance should be assigned in times of difficulty and who in times of peace should live in dignity and quiet enjoying the honours that he had earned he demanded no more at present than the ratification of his arrangement in asia and a liberal provision of land or money for his faithful legions expecting to find the people grateful for all his splendid successes in the east pompey came confidently before them to give an account of his doings of the last five years to his surprise he found that the roman public was only half informed as to his achievements and rather disposed to be indifferent to them his first oration says cicero promised nothing to the poor it gave no encouragement to the democrats to the wealthy it was unsympathetic to the optimates it seemed trivial instead of meeting with a brilliant reception he was pestered with a hail of questions on domestic politics from the spokesmen of the rival parties in the state did he or did he not approve of the execution of the catalinian conspirators was cicero pater patriae or guilty of judicial murder pompey was surprised and gave no certain sound itaque frigebat says cicero he was coldly received by every one the senate nevertheless might have made him their good friend by a little courtesy and encouragement for he disliked crassus far more than any of the leaders of the optimates and he quite realized the way in which the democratic party had been working against him in his absence cicero hoped for a time to secure the alliance but there were insuperable difficulties in the way in the first place the orator could not speak for his party or conclude any bargain in its behalf for the short-sighted oligarchs whose leader he imagined that he was declined to follow him when lucullus and cato declared that pompey was not a safe ally the majority of the senatorial party trusted them rather than cicero they adopted an attitude of covert hostility to the great general and when the critical day came round would not vote that his requests should be conceded if anything more was needed to estrange pompey from the optimates it was the personal character of cicero the orator wished to be friendly with him he loved to go about in his company and hear him called in jest Gnaeus cicero but this was merely because it gratified his vanity to be able to treat as an equal the man to whom he had once looked up as a leader the two were not really suited to be friends pompey was stolid and solid and wholly uninterested in literature or society cicero was a literary man to the finger-tips with all the self-consciousness and vanity of the artistic temperament it is certain that they bored each other and that their friendship was a hollow and lukewarm affair pompey might have continued to tolerate cicero if the latter had been able to carry out his share in the projected alliance to induce the optimate party to grant the ratification of the asiatic treaties and the provision of land and money for the disbanded veterans but this cicero proved utterly unable to do meanwhile he irritated his would-be friend by his ludicrous vanity and his oratorical airs and graces we have already seen while dealing with the life of crassus how he succeeded in offending pompey by his otolatrous harangues in the senate and his frank assumption of equality with his former chief as the year b c sixty wore on pompey came gradually to see that he would never get his very moderate demands conceded by the senate his disgust was complete when cato at the instigation of lucullus proposed and carried a motion to the effect that his asiatic acta should not be ratified but that the senate should go through and criticize every treaty and edict that he had made confirming or rejecting each as it might think proper the proposal to provide land for the veterans was also taken into consideration but it came to nothing on the excuse that the treasury was empty a manifest evasion since the enormous asiatic spoils had been very recently paid into the public chest when pompey set up his friend the tribune lucius flavius to propose a plebiscitum giving a competent grant of land to the soldiers 
democrats and optimates combined against him and the bill had to be dropped it is impossible not to regret the unwisdom of cicero and the suspicious hostility of cato which frustrated the chance that pompey might settle down once more into an honourable retirement but his present position was unbearable because he had neither armed cohorts at his back nor bands of hired rioters to sweep the streets he was impotent he might still have got what he wanted by raising his hand and bidding his old legions reassemble forty thousand angry and disappointed men would have rallied around him in a moment but however much provoked he shrank from open treason and from civil war before all things he was a good citizen and now as in b c seventy one he made no unconstitutional move but when he received the offer of the democratic chiefs to do for him what the senate had refused and to obtain for him complete legal satisfaction of his desires he did not now draw back caesar had shown his willingness for an alliance by supporting metellus nepos in b c sixty two crassus also now came forward with proffers of friendship though he had almost fled from before pompey's face when first he returned to italy and though he had been doing his best to thwart him ever since seeing no other way out of his difficulties the conqueror of the east reluctantly accepted their advances and the first triumvirate came into being once before in b c seventy one pompey had leagued himself with his rival then the alliance had been a passing phase in politics and no permanent results had followed from it but the first triumvirate was a very different matter it was the dominating fact of the next ten years and marked a new stage in the decadence of the roman republic the state had experienced before the tyrannical domination of a party under cinna and sulla but the triumvirs were not a party it would be ridiculous to call their success a triumph of the democratic faction they were three men of very different character and aims who had combined to secure their personal ends and not to carry out any party programme pompey received all that he had asked in a matter of grants and laws and was no doubt satisfied for the moment but it must very soon have been borne in upon him that he had now made himself a mere partner in a firm the days when his personal influence could be exerted for any end that he chose were over in all his doings he would have for the future to consult his partners he was no longer responsible to himself only but had to consider the wishes of caesar and crassus meanwhile there was no crisis either at home or abroad which seemed likely to provide work for pompey in such times of peace he had been wont to relapse into a dignified retirement till he should again be wanted this was once more the line that he took in b c fifty nine forgetting that his whole position had now been altered by the fact that he had accepted a place in the triumvirate it is a different thing to be a general taking holiday on furlough and to be a sleeping partner in a great firm the soldier liable to be called back to the field at any moment has no responsibilities save to his country and may do much as he pleases but the partner who does not take his share in everyday business and prefers dignity and leisure to the incessant work of supervising details gradually loses his controlling power when he does on occasion sally forth from his retirement he finds that he has got out of touch with the affairs of the firm he may resent the situation but he will find it difficult to reassert himself this is more or less what happened to pompey during his long alliance with caesar and crassus no sooner had he seen the bills in which he was interested safely passed through the comitia than he withdrew for a space into private life as one of the pledges of the alliance he had married julia the young and charming daughter of caesar he retired with her to his alban villa seldom came down into rome and took no important part in public business of his colleagues crassus seems to have relapsed once more into his obscure wire pulling behind the scenes caesar had gone off to gaul there to build up the army which was one day to make him the master of the world 
there was no doubt that the triumvirs could when they pleased make their power felt and do anything that they might choose but for a space they did not assert themselves and allowed the local politics of the streets and the senate house to drift on in their old fashion the fact had yet to be realized that those who have taken responsibility upon themselves must interfere in small matters as well as in great if they wish their power to be remembered and respected while pompey lived the life of the aristotelian megalopsuchus and kept aloof from the dirty details of politics while crassus jobbed and intrigued and caesar slew germans and helvetii in eastern gaul the city was disturbed by all manner of unnecessary riots and tumults the work of that irresponsible and absurd personage the demagogue clodius since the downfall of the concordium ordinum and the triumph of the triumvirs the senate was wholly incapable of keeping order in the streets on the other hand the new triple alliance did not choose to undertake the task indeed there was no legal machinery by which they could have done so so while the fortunes of the world were really being settled in gaul the city was at the mercy of the noisy young aristocrat who wished to be taken for the heir of the gracchi and of saturninus clodius was an accurate copy of caesar so far as debts debauchery and a talent for mob oratory could go he called himself the last of the great democratic tribunes but he was really nothing more than an exuberant rowdy who loved rioting for rioting's sake his only redeeming qualities were a sense of humour and a love of practical jokes it is impossible to take him seriously if we did we should have to denounce him as the worst example of the decadent roman he was of no real political importance his programme was a patch-cloth of flimsy odds and ends from the rag-bag of the practically defunct democratic party any one that had the command of a half a dozen cohorts could have disposed of him in ten minutes the days were past in which the city mob was a factor of serious importance in roman politics but as long as the triumvirs let him alone he could do much as he pleased in the forum and he made himself an intolerable nuisance for seven long years the proper way to have dealt with his pestilent fellow would have been to borrow half a legion from caesar and clear him and his myrmidons out of the city the senate could not do this and pompey and crassus would not at first he had been their tool when he set up in business for himself they suffered him for a long time to deal with the optimates as he chose pompey would not even intervene to save cicero from banishment in spite of all the orator's appeals he considered that he had been badly treated by him in b c sixty and was not unwilling that he should have a lesson which would show him the vanity of his belief in his own political importance after no very long time of waiting the orator was avenged for clodius intoxicated with his long series of successes in the forum took to treating pompey himself with less respect than was his due he began with releasing contrary to the triumvir's wishes the captive son of tigron the armenian king who was being kept at rome to prevent him from raising trouble in the east then he prosecuted some of pompey's dependents and when their patron came down to give evidence in their behalf assailed him with ribald insults and set a carefully selected mob to hoot at him pompey's dignity was hurt he had often been the object of hate and fear in his earlier years but it was a new thing to be the butt of vulgar jokes to be called in one breath the tyrant of rome and the man who scratches his head with one finger it may be hard to say what is the right course for a respectable politician of first-rate importance to take when he has been mocked and flouted by a vulgar demagogue it is clear however that pompey's reply to clodius was a hideous mistake he summoned clients and pugilists about him and replied by violence to the violence of the tribune this was undignified unwise and unprofitable it was honouring the rowdy overmuch to copy his methods but the worst thing of all was that pompey was not even successful his bands were amateurs in rioting compared with the partisans of clodius they were several times out of the field and he himself was beleaguered in his own house 
this wretched interlude lasted throughout the later months of the tribunate of clodius and it was not till he had gone out of office that things righted themselves a little and pompey was able to reassert himself in the next year he took his revenge on the demagogue by assisting the leading optimates to recall cicero from exile the orator had learnt his lesson and no longer overestimated his power and authority he never forgave pompey for having allowed him to be expelled in b c fifty eight however he was constrained to behave as if gratitude for his tardy return was his only sentiment shortly after reaching rome he is found supporting an important proposal for the creation of a new special commission for pompey's benefit some five years had now passed since the great general had held any office and he seems to have thought that it was high time that he should again come forward something must be done to make the senate and people forget the ignominious contest with clodius in which he had cut such a poor figure no war was raging at the moment save indeed the belgic campaign in which caesar was winning new laurels but if pompey could not ask for military work there was a tiresome administrative problem at hand with which he thought himself competent to deal the year b c fifty seven was a time of dearth and famine all over the mediterranean lands and even rome itself was suffering from scarcity there was no regular machinery in the constitution for dealing with such troubles and in earlier years famines had been met by special decrees of the senate appointing persons to buy corn at a hint from pompey his friends led by the tribune messius brought forward the proposal that a special commissionership should be assigned to him empowering him not only to deal with the existing dearth but to reorganize the corn supply of italy on a permanent basis remembering the times of plenty which had followed on his campaign against the pirates the people eagerly took up the cry even though clodius tried to persuade them that the famine had been brought about by a deliberate corner in wheat got up by pompey's friends the accusation was a little too absurd to deceive even the denizens of the suburra in spite of the demagogue's noisy opposition and the secret intrigues of the irreconcilable optimates a commission was granted to pompey which gave him charge of the corn supply for five years placed a large sum of money at his disposal and granted him proconsular authority concurrent with that of the governors in the provinces a very unnecessary addition to the effect that he should also be empowered to raise a war fleet and a land force if he found it necessary was rejected it does not seem that pompey himself asked for such a grant it was probably the invention of some of those overzealous friends with whom most statesmen are cursed the famine was daily growing worse and the high commissioner did not delay his departure he announced that he himself would visit sicily africa and sardinia while his legates should deal with the remoter provinces he set sail in the midst of a fearful tempest early in november b c fifty seven the captain of his vessel made much ado as to starting and asked him to wait for a few days till the gale should have blown over it is necessary to sail it is not necessary to live replied pompey and put to sea in the face of the tempest in this commission as in every other administrative work that he took in hand pompey acquitted himself in the most satisfactory way his winter voyage to sicily and africa turned out most prosperously when he sought for corn he found it apparently the dearth had been due as much to maladministration by the local governors as to a real shortness of supply he insisted that in spite of the season ships should be sent out at once to carry the grain that he had collected to italy in short his success was answerable to his energy he covered the sea with vessels and filled the markets with wheat insomuch that there was soon an over surplus in rome to feed the provinces and plenty as if from a fountain flowed over the world from the city nor was it only the needs of the moment that were provided for pompey made permanent arrangements for the improvement of the corn supply which worked perfectly well during the short remainder of the republican regime while he was still absent in sicily there was a complicated interlude at rome the worthless king of egypt ptolemy auletes who had just been expelled from his realm by the alexandrines came to italy to seek for help there was considerable competition among the leading men at rome for the commission to restore him to his throne 
for such jobs were always profitable to the commander to whom they were entrusted. Lentulus Spinter and several others intrigued for the post, and while they were wrangling, Pompey's friends proposed that he should be sent to Egypt as soon as his present task was completed. The optimates hunted up a Sibylline oracle to the effect that the king must not be restored by an army, but when the news reached Pompey, he sent back a message that he was prepared to restore Ptolemy without asking for a single cohort. It would merely be a matter for negotiations. In accordance with this hint, the tribune Caninius brought forward a bill providing that Pompey should be sent to Alexandria with no more retinue than two lictors, in order to reconcile the king to his subjects. But the optimates used all their influence against the proposal, employing the hypocritical plea that so valuable a life must not be risked among the turbulent Egyptians. The Caninian bill was rejected, and Ptolemy went back to the east. In the next year he got himself restored by a private bargain with Gabinius, the proconsul of Syria, a simpler if not a cheaper method than that of making a formal appeal to the Senate and people. In spite of the fact that he had stopped the famine, Pompey found that he was in a more unenviable position than ever when he returned to Rome. The optimates, elated by the rejection of the Caninian bill, raised their heads and dared openly to oppose him. Clodius began once more to make him the mark of the foulest abuse, and to raise mobs against him. Crassus, in spite of the fact that the alliance of B.C. 60 was still ostensibly in existence, intrigued against him and even so pompey complained became privy to a plot for his assassination so helpless did he feel that he resolved at last to appeal to caesar the one man who was able if he chose both to make clodius keep silence and to frighten the optimates this must have been a bitter humiliation to him he had to confess that he had proved totally unable to manage domestic affairs and to ask for the second time for his father-in-law's help. Caesar was now a very different personage from the mere democratic politician of B.C. 59. His Helvetian, German, and Belgic campaigns had raised him to the highest rank as a general, and he already had a numerous and devoted army at his back. Pompey must have felt that their relative importance was much changed since they had last met each other on the eve of Caesar's departure for Gaul, then he had been Rome's only general, and his colleague a clever demagogue with a doubtful past. Now he was a notorious political failure, and Caesar the idol of the soldiery. But the Gallic Wars were only half over, and it is probable that the elder man did not even yet realize his ally's full genius. It was to Caesar, the manager of Rome's politics, not to Caesar, the master of many legions, that he was appealing. Pompey's visit to his father-in-law's province was made in the guise of a mere side excursion. While purporting to be on his way to Corsica and Sardinia to reorganize the corn supply, he turned aside to Lucca, where Caesar had fixed his quarters for the winter of B.C. 57-56. to He was not the only visitor whom the proconsul of Gaul had received. Crassus had been with Caesar at Ravenna a few weeks before, bent on the opposite design. He thought that he at last saw his opportunity for edging Pompey entirely out of his political position. If Caesar refused him help, he would sink into insignificance and become a mere negligible quantity. But it was not the intention of the conqueror of Gaul to break with either of his colleagues. He preferred that during his absence there should be a balance of power at Rome. It would not suit him that either Pompey or Crassus should be reduced to impotence. Still less was it his game that the optimates should be allowed to seize the reins of power. The more distracted were home politics, the more important would be his own position. Some day he would come back to Rome to work his will, and when that day should come, he would prefer to find the city masterless and ill-governed. Meanwhile, there was still much work to be done in Gaul. The province was but half subdued, and his own army was not as yet so large or so devoted to himself as he hoped to make it. Hence it came to pass that the conference at Lucca ended in a way that must have been unexpected to many of the onlookers. Caesar insisted that Pompey and Crassus should both remain as allies, and once more, as in B.C. 70, 
they went through a solemn farce of reconciliation and professed to put away their old quarrels the next step was to draw up the political programme for the ensuing year caesar claimed nothing more for himself than the renewal of his proconsulship in gaul for another five years and the right to raise more legions in return for this concession he undertook not only to get pompey and crassus made consuls for b c fifty five but to allow each of them to take a province and an army when their year of consulship should have expired pompey was to receive spain crassus syria these were astoundingly liberal terms caesar seemed to be arming his colleagues against himself and to be making them the present of a position which they could not have obtained by their own exertions for it was he and not they who managed the whole business he had but to give this signal and pull the wires and immediately clodius relapsed into silence and the optimates drew back in their horns and stood still it is not till we mark the consequences of the conference of lucca that we realize how predominant was the position that caesar had already acquired to his ancient power of intrigue and mob management he now added the command of an ample provincial treasury and a large army absent though he was from rome he could secure that his desires should be carried out if he now assigned provinces and legions to his confederates it was because he knew their characters well and did not fear them they would always be at secret enmity with each other and would practically cancel each other as factors in the political situation meanwhile they would as he calculated keep the optimates quiet each of them had suffered too much from the senatorial party to be willing to conclude an alliance with it in making this political forecast caesar committed an error pompey and crassus duly received their consulships and provinces and the optimates were duly repressed cicero as their representative was forced to make that apology for his late attempts to kick against the triumvirs which he called his recantation palinodia so far things went well for caesar but he had not allowed for two possibilities the first was the death of crassus who lost his life and his army at carrhae in b c fifty three by his removal from the scene the counterweight which kept pompey in check ceased to exist the second factor in the new situation was the growth of an overmastering jealousy in pompey's mind which led him into paths where it had seemed unlikely that he would ever stray the elder general did not want to be king or dictator of rome this he had proved half a dozen times already but he was also entirely resolved that no one else should aspire to such a position and month by month it grew more clear that caesar might do so this pompey was determined to prevent he had given himself a colleague but he did not intend that his colleague should become his master such was the secret at the bottom of that gradual estrangement between the two men which grew more and more evident as the years b c fifty three to fifty rolled on both morally and legally pompey's suspicions of caesar were entirely justifiable but unfortunately he had placed himself under great obligations to his colleague his conduct was bound to wear an invidious aspect when he began first to take measures of precaution against the man who had helped him out of his difficulties and then openly to oppose him of this he was himself well aware it was the main reason for his long hesitation and hanging back before he finally declared himself the foe of his benefactor when cato not long before hostilities commenced taunted him with having allowed caesar to grow to his present greatness unopposed pompey replied that the man had been his friend and his father-in-law end of section twenty three Section twenty four of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Ullman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter eight Pompey. Part four. Those who with Mumpson attribute to Pompey nothing but the meanest impulses call personal jealousy alone the cause of his breach with Caesar and that feeling was undoubtedly a powerful element among the mixed motives which swayed his mind but there was something more there was the honest political conviction 
that Rome did not want a despot. He himself, whose opportunities in the past had been so great, had not chosen to be king. Why should another be allowed to snatch at the crown? The literary partisans of Caesar justify their hero by replying that he turned out to be a heaven-sent saviour of society. But even granting that this is true, how could any Roman of B.C. 51 have known it? Caesar was naturally judged by his dubious past, not by the glorious present in Gaul, his future no man could have foreseen. It is clear, then, that the steady growth of Caesar's fame, wealth, and political influence gradually frightened Pompey into precautionary measures which could not be justified according to the strict letter of Roman constitutional law. After his consulship of B.C. 55 had expired, he ought to have raised the legions which had been granted to him and to have gone off to take up his province of Spain, just as Crassus had departed to take up his province of Syria. Instead of doing so, Pompey lingered behind in Rome, and only sent his legates, Afranius and Petraeus, to Spain. Moreover, after mustering his legions, he dispatched some to his province, but dismissed others on furlough, so that, though disembodied, they could be called out when he needed them. This practically amounted to keeping an army in Italy, a most unconstitutional step. It gave Pompey the power of overawing the Senate, but had obvious military disadvantages, for troops left long on furlough lose their efficiency and esprit de corps. That he did not really aim at absolute power is sufficiently shown by the fact that he never employed his army against the state, but what could be a worse precedent than to keep it in Italy? After committing such a breach of constitutional usage as retaining his Spanish proconsulship and his legions while he still remained at home, Pompey could not plausibly complain of any acts of doubtful legality on Caesar's part. It is curious to find that even while Pompey and his legions were looking on, Rome remained as turbulent as ever. The years B.C. 54 to 53 were the most anarchic time that had been seen since Catiline's day, and the perpetual riots and affrays stirred up by Clodius and his rival Milo made the city almost uninhabitable. The very consular elections could not be held in 54, so that in the early months of B.C. 53 the state had no existing supreme magistrate. It was not till the middle of the year that Domitius Calvinus and Valerius Massala were elected and installed. Things only grew worse in the autumn. Again, the consular comitia was broken up by violence, without any new magistrate having been elected. At the moment when Milo murdered Clodius, on January 18th, B.C. 52, Rome was again destitute of consuls, and there was no one whose office it was to repress the fearful riots that followed when the Senate House was burnt, and the streets were for some days in the possession of an armed mob which only failed to carry out a revolution because it lacked able leaders. Such phenomena hardly justified Pompey's policy of remaining in Italy. While he pretended to be the first man in the state, and had military force at his back, it was absurd that anarchy should be allowed to prevail in the city. It is true that when the Senate at last made a definite appeal to him to act, and allowed him to be given the strange office of sole consul, Pompey promptly restored order. He mobilized many of his cohorts, brought them within the city, stopped the rioting, and caused both Milo, the slayer of Clodius, on the one side, and Plancus and Rufus, the leaders of the democratic mob on the other, to be tried and sent into exile. But if he was able to do this with such ease in the spring of B.C. 52, it is clear that he might have stopped the anarchy eighteen months before. A statesman who let matters drift so long before he intervened was not fitted to deal with the hopeless constitutional problems of the degenerate republic but his honesty at least was made more evident than ever when after the suppression of the urban disorders he took a colleague in the consulship 
dismissed his troops, and finally dropped back into his old position. By this time it was practically certain that the open breach between the two surviving triumvirs could not be long delayed. Julia, the strongest bond between them, for both loved her well, had died in B.C. 54. The last act of undoubted friendship that ever linked them, the loan of a legion by Pompey to Caesar to repair the loss of the cohorts which perished with Sabinus and Cotta, took place in 53. After 52, the war might have broken out at any moment, but Pompey, jealous and suspicious as he felt, shrank from striking the first blow, while Caesar's hands were completely tied by the great revolt in Gaul under Vercingetorix, which was not wholly suppressed till the autumn of B.C. 51. By that time Pompey's attitude could not be mistaken. He had given his aid to the Optimates for the renewal of the celebrated law which declared that all candidates for office must come to Rome and sue in person. A direct challenge to his colleague, who had let it be known that he intended to stand for the consulship of B.C. 48, but did not intend to leave Gaul till he had been safely elected. Such a move seemed to show that the long-delayed rupture between the two great men was at last about to take place. Caesar was determined to see exactly how matters stood, and wrote to demand an explanation. But when he made formal complaints to Pompey as to his hostile action, the latter with inexplicable feebleness allowed a clause to be added to the law which exempted caesar by name from its operation but as this supplement was never even submitted to the comitia it was of more than doubtful legality either pompey was trying to pacify his ally by a concession which could be afterwards denounced as invalid or he was strangely ignorant of legislative technicalities his personal character and reputation for honesty tell against the former supposition. We can but hope that jealousy and suspicion had not degraded him into unworthy double-dealing, but the general effect of the incident is dubious. Into the miserable wrangle over the constitutional technicalities which filled the year B.C. 50, we need not inquire in detail. The legal pettifogging on both sides could not conceal the main facts, caesar was resolved to have the consulship for b c forty eight and to rule as supreme magistrate at rome for that year and probably for many a year to follow on the other hand cato and his friends were honestly convinced that the installation of caesar as consul would mean the establishment of monarchy of a monarchy half military half democratic which would probably be inaugurated with a proscription and a general confiscation of the property of the monarch's political opponents. What else could be expected from a tyrant who had conspired with Catiline, and who had employed and encouraged Clodius? Pompey may not have thought so badly of his late father-in-law, but he was as fully convinced as the Optimates themselves that Caesar aimed at supreme power, and while he lived he did not intend to suffer a master to be placed over his head he had not refused half a dozen times to make himself tyrant of rome in order that another man should be given the chance and should accept it the struggle was inevitable and it was to no purpose that the weaker men in the senate who failed to grasp the meaning of the situation continued to cry for peace and to pass idle votes calling on both caesar and pompey to lay down their official positions and disband their armies caesar would not disarm unless pompey did the same pompey refused to do so because he was fully convinced that if he had not an army at his back when caesar came home from gaul he would find himself helpless he had at last realized the fact that he was utterly unable to control domestic politics while caesar was an adept at managing a mob or raising a riot if neither side were armed it was certain that his rival would sweep the streets and get control of the comitia even while absent in his province caesar had been able to intervene with effect whenever he chose and he had now enlisted as his political lieutenants all the promising young demagogues of rome all that gang of which antony curio 
caelius and dolabella were the most prominent members they were not a very reputable set of followers but there was not one of them who could not have given pompey lessons in the art of mob management so pompey with the full approval of cato and the optimates refused either to depart to spain or to lay down his province and to disband his legions this being so caesar could do no more than search for the best technical casus belli on which to cross the rubicon and march on rome his adversaries were obliging enough to provide him with a very fair plea of the kind that he wanted by mishandling and expelling his satellites the tribunes antony and cassius it was with the fine old democratic cry that the tribunicial authority the palladium of the constitution must at all costs be protected that caesar launched his legions into central italy much earlier than his enemies had expected him to take the decisive step the winter campaign of b c forty nine is one of the best examples in history of the all-importance of time in war pompey's military merits were many but rapidity was not one of them he was a good organizer a sure and steady leader a capable strategist but he was not one of those generals who fly from point to point with lightning speed and win by swift marching as much as by hard fighting caesar's sudden move across the rubicon had caught him with his army still unmobilized to those who had questioned him about his preparations he had replied that he had but to stamp his foot in any part of italy and legions would at once spring up the boast was not unfounded for his name had still the greatest influence with the military classes and if he had been allowed a few weeks of preparation he would have taken the field at the head of an imposing force but caesar knew the fact and was determined that those few weeks should not be granted him it was this knowledge that made him strike so early and advance into picanum with a mere vanguard while the main body of his legions was still trailing through the alpine passes this sudden eruption disarranged all pompey's plans instead of being able to mobilize at leisure and to face the invader on the frontier he was forced to abandon rome in the first days of the war and to order his recruits to collect far to the south in apulia he had no force actually under arms and capable of taking the field save two legions at capua which could not lightly be trusted for they had been under caesar's orders till the preceding year and had been borrowed from him for the ostensible purpose of being sent to the parthian war if pompey risked opposing them to their old leader it is possible or even probable that they would desert to him en masse they were not given the chance but they were marched off at once to the south and out of harm's way the levies of northern italy were never raised by the republicans caesar had been too quick for them but those of the central regions ought to have been led in safety to the camp at luceria the great centre of mobilization if pompey's orders had been properly carried out if they had arrived it might yet have been possible to maintain a hold on southern italy but the plan of campaign was ruined by the strange mixture of presumption and cowardice displayed by lucius domitius ahenobarbus one of the many officers of tried optimate principles and equally tried incapacity whom pompey had been forced to put in high command with twenty thousand newly embodied men not wholly armed nor even told off into legions domitius ventured to oppose himself to caesar in spite of orders that bade him march for luceria without risking the smallest skirmish he was promptly surrounded driven into corfinium and blockaded seven days later the undisciplined horde of conscripts surrendered to caesar when they saw that there was no relief at hand and that their general was preparing to abscond by night and to leave them in the lurch deprived of half the army which he had hoped to concentrate at luceria and left alone with two untrustworthy legions and the not over-numerous levies of apulia and lucania pompey dared not fight in spite of the complaints and criticisms of his optimate allies even cicero dared to taunt him with want of military skill 
he resolved to evacuate italy and retire to epirus where under cover of his fleet he might drill and organize his recruits in safety the whole army was shipped off from brundisium in spite of caesar's efforts to prevent its retreat when pressed by his opponent pompey showed that his old reputation was not undeserved by foiling the attack of the gallic legions and bringing off his whole force without any appreciable loss it was now only the seventeenth of march and the whole campaigning season lay at the disposal of the two adversaries but pompey could not use it for active operations he had to form his masses of conscripts into a fighting machine and to wait for the distant reinforcements that could be raised in the east there were two old legions in syria the rex of crassus his host and one other in cilicia more could undoubtedly be raised among the numerous roman citizens residing in greece and asia but it would take months to bring these distant resources into working order meanwhile pompey could do nothing but order his fleet to blockade italy and to prevent the caesareans from taking ship to follow him across the ionian sea caesar on the other hand was in a very different position his old army was entirely at his disposition and he had already raised many new legions from italy secure against any interruption from pompey for many months he could strike at the one region where the republican party was really strong spain in that province lay seven old legions devoted to pompey if not to the senate they were in charge of afranius and petraeus two commonplace veterans willing and courageous enough but destitute of any spark of military genius caesar resolved to destroy this dangerous force in his rear before paying any further attention to pompey's disorganized host i march he said to deal with the army that has no general i shall then come back to deal with the general who has no army he carried out his project in a campaign of three short months he defeated surrounded and captured five of the pompeian legions at ilerda the other two surrendered a few weeks later long ere the army of epirus was ready to move caesar was back again in italy and planning out his second task the destruction of pompey's main body when pompey and caesar were once face to face we note that the younger general found that his task was far harder than he had supposed it was the best contested campaign that he ever conducted hazardous it was bound to be since the republicans were in very superior force but caesar endeavoured to reduce the hazard to a minimum and in especial made his troops entrench and stockade themselves in the most laborious fashion he could have paid no greater compliment to his adversary's generalship for he knew that man for man his soldiers were each worth two of pompey's recruits pompey on the other hand was bound to show an even greater caution if once his active and vigilant enemy could force a battle upon him on anything like equal ground the result in spite of their relative numbers would be more than doubtful it was his object to contain and check caesar rather than to endeavour to destroy him his strategy had to be defensive and for ultimate success he relied on his power to starve out his adversary by confining him to a narrow strip of barren coastline and cutting off his supplies that came by sea in all of this he was successful caesar's attempts to bring on a battle were foiled the war stood still for four months in the long lines which both parties had constructed outside Dyrrhachium. this delay was all in pompey's favour for he had far more reinforcements to expect and resources to draw upon than his opponent when caesar tried the desperate game of trying to cast a complete circumvallation around the republican camp he was utterly foiled waiting till the line some twenty miles long grew over thin pompey burst out one morning broke through the entrenchments drove off the legions opposed to him and inflicted on the caesarians a loss which their leader himself confesses to have amounted to over one thousand men the prospects of the great adventurer looked dark his food was giving out his ranks were growing thin even his hardy veterans were somewhat dashed in spirits by their first defeat the prolongation of the present situation was impossible and caesar tried his last move it was skilful and daring 
but hazardous in the extreme abandoning his lines he marched off southward and then struck inland up the valley of the aus across the Epirot mountains as if he were meditating a blow at his opponent's base at thessalonica pompey would probably have done well to have let caesar march whither he pleased and to have thrown his whole army on to italy his fleet could have taken him over in a few days and the peninsula was practically undefended there was nothing but a legion or two of recruits to defend the caesarian cause and the countryside would probably have received the return of pompey with enthusiasm but pompey preferred to consider caesar and his army not rome as his objective and marched off inland in the pursuit of the enemy he came up with them at pharsalus and there at last risked battle there was much to encourage him his legions were improving in value every day during the last combats round Dyrrhachium they had behaved admirably he had nearly double his adversary's numbers including a force of cavalry to which caesar had hardly anything to oppose his officers were set on fighting the optimates thought that they had their enemy in a trap and were only anxious to make an end of him their constant appeals which grew into taunts and angry recriminations finally drove their commander into risking the general engagement which he had so long avoided he was as it turned out misled when he yielded to the murmurs of his officers and the prayers of his legionaries the great battle in the plain of pharsalus turned out a complete disaster not from any want of tactical skill in pompey but mainly from the inferior quality of his men he had determined to win by a desperate cavalry assault upon the enemy's flank it failed simply because the horsemen mainly asiatic auxiliaries did not press the charge home and allowed themselves to be beaten back by the band of indomitable veterans whom caesar had told off as his flank guard the cavalry rode off the field and the flank of the pompeian legions who had so far held their ground with commendable steadiness was left exposed to the enemy caesar used his reserve to strike in upon the undefended point and suddenly the hitherto unbroken line of the republican infantry crumpled up and the whole force rolled back in confusion into their camp and then after a short attempt to defend the vallum retreated in utter disorder into the hills the day was lost the army scattered to the winds and pompey broken-hearted at the sudden and disastrous end of his hitherto successful campaign rode off the field not following the main mass of the fugitives but seeking the sea when he saw that he was not pursued he went softly on wrapped up in such thoughts as we may suppose a man to have who had been used for thirty-four years to conquer and to carry all before him and now on the verge of old age first came to know what it was to be a vanquished fugitive in one short hour he had lost the glory and power which had grown up among so many wars and conflicts and he who was lately guarded with so many armies and fleets rode on with such a scanty train that the enemies who were in search of him passed over the little party without noticing them footnote plutarch End footnote. at the mount of the peneus pompey was taken up by a casual trading vessel putting into mytilene he packed up his wife and some other roman refugees he collected a few ships in the asiatic waters and when his depression had passed away began to think once more of reorganizing resistance in the east for that purpose he sailed for the nile where he wished to prevail on the egyptian government to lend him the considerable mercenary army largely composed of italians of which it could dispose the boy king the son of ptolemy aulades was only ten years old and the control of the state was in the hands of a camarilla of obscure courtiers the eunuch patinus the rhetorician theodotus of chios and the condottieri Achilas. the miserable levantines were scared at the news of pompey's approach they did not for a moment think of lending him assistance but at first they had no further purpose than that of getting rid as quickly as possible of their unwelcome guest but a thought struck the rhetorician if we receive pompey he said we make caesar our enemy if we reject pompey we earn his undying hatred 
and it is quite possible that he and his cause may yet triumph in the end but if we lure him ashore and kill him we do caesar a favour and have nothing to fear from pompey for he added with a smile dead men do not bite the argument seemed unanswerable to the egyptian privy council and the plan was carried out with complete success the great general was invited to land and promised an audience with the young king achilas rode out to his galley taking with him septimius and salvius two centurions who had once served under pompey in the east but were now holding a high rank in the egyptian army reassured by the sight of these roman faces and by the smooth words of achilas pompey descended into their barge and was rowed ashore just as he stepped on to the beach the three traitors drew their swords and stabbed him from behind he fell dead almost before he realized that he had been betrayed and without uttering a single word so ended an honest man and an able general the victim partly of his own unwise persistence in trying to pose as a great statesman partly of the incurable rottenness of decadent rome he should have been born two hundred years before when the ancient roman virtues still met their reward and when it was possible to be the first soldier of the republic without being also required to become an autocrat or a saviour of society military greatness he had won with his sword political importance was thrust upon him by the inevitable tendency of the times he yielded unhappily for himself to the temptation of playing a part in politics of overturning constitutions and dictating laws tyrant of rome he never wished to be yet he was led into doing many things tyrannical all his life shows that he aspired to nothing more than the place of first citizen in the republic yet he helped to make the republic impossible by setting precedents and examples of fatal encroachment on the free constitution the gabinian and manilian laws and the sole consulship of b c fifty two were landmarks in the history of the growth of the imperial idea pompey neither reigned nor wished to reign himself but he did much to make monarchy possible for his rival and successor End of section twenty four section twenty five of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter nine caesar part one many and diverse have been the views taken of caesar and his career during the nineteen hundred and forty six years that have elapsed since his death he did much to shape the future destinies of the world more perhaps than any other single man that has ever lived and even in the darkest times of the middle ages his story was not forgotten it may be said that when we have ascertained the way in which caesar was regarded in any particular century we know at once the general character of that century's outlook on history from the days of charlemagne down to the renaissance the holy roman empire was the great political ideal of christendom caesar as the founder of that empire was regarded as a semi-divine figure he lacked but christianity to make him the patron saint of europe certainly the nimbus would have sat upon his head with as good a grace as on that of constantine whose tardy baptism hid a multitude of sins and crimes from the eyes of the middle ages but pagan though he was caesar commanded the unquestioning respect of thirty generations of christians the best proof perhaps of the aspect that he presented to the men of medieval europe is that dante in his vision of the midmost hell where the worst of all sinners suffer the direst of all punishments saw three figures only in the mouth of the arch-fiend judas iscariot brutus and cassius the traitors who murdered their master in the senate house found only one fit companion the traitor who betrayed his master in the garden of gethsemane astounding as such a view appears to us we must recognize that it was entertained by the best minds of the middle ages dante was no ignorant chronicler but a much-read man 
a great political thinker who looked out on a broad field of historical knowledge before he drew his conclusions ere three centuries more had gone by brutus and caesar had changed places in popular estimation the scholars of the renaissance with their plato and their plutarch before them had reconstructed the old republican ideas of the elder world to them brutus was the last of the romans the martyr of freedom and caesar's murder was tyrannicide the righteous slaughter of the enemy of the state instead of being the revered founder of the sacred empire the dictator had become the splendid criminal who made an end of laws and liberty his greatness could not be impeached but he served as the type of reckless ambition which strides through battle and ruin to a bloody grave this was the caesar that shakespeare knew it needs but a glance through his tragedy to see that brutus is the hero caesar in spite of all his genius and his magnanimity is at bottom the man in love with power who cannot be happy till he has added the sceptre and the crown to the imperator's purple robe there is no hint that he desired to rule for others benefit to reform the world to reconstitute an empire that was falling into hopeless rottenness yet another four hundred years have gone by and now a third reading of caesar's career is presented to us we are told to recognize in him the great saviour of society the man who saw that the republic had gone too far on the way to decay to be capable of restoration and who resolved to save the citizens in spite of themselves even if it were necessary in the process to sweep away all the old constitutional landmarks and to introduce autocracy mommsen the most extreme advocate of this school goes so far as to praise in caesar the man who felt within his breast true kingly greatness and therefore rightly felt that he must make himself a king the doctrine seems dangerous of a thousand able and pushing young men who fancy themselves the chosen instruments of fate nine hundred and ninety-nine turn out to be the type of alcibiades or clodius or rienzi and only the thousandth is a caesar it does not seem wise to encourage the man of ability to regard laws and constitutions as trifles which he may sweep away in the justifiable endeavour to assert his personality and live his life every one must grant that the roman republic with its absurd and antiquated state machinery had gradually sunk into a hopeless slough from which it seemed impossible that it could ever be dragged out there was even less hope of salvation from the democratic party than from the optimates both factions their ideals and their programmes were hopelessly played out but in spite of all we refuse our moral sympathy to the affable versatile unscrupulous man of genius who made an end of the old order of things caesar had many aspects as the manager of mobs and the puller of political wires as the general as the legislator as the organizer of provinces colonies and municipalities as the litterateur and the man of fashion we know him well but caesar the altruist is a fiction of the nineteenth century to read into his many-sided activity the ideals of a benevolent prophet who wished to restore the golden age is absurd rather was he a brilliant opportunist dealing sanely and practically in turn with each problem that came before him enlightened ambition and the love of doing work well if it has to be done at all explain his career of real unselfishness or idealism there is not a trace if he ever denied himself anything that he desired it was because he saw that the result of indulgence would be dangerous to his political schemes his self-restraint was strong enough to enable him to refuse even the crown itself the dearest object of all his wishes when he saw that the move would be unpopular but it was policy and not conscience that kept him back on this and on many another occasion to represent caesar even in his later years as a kind of saint and benefactor who had lived down his earlier foibles is wholly untrue to the facts of his life the man is consistent all through his career the dictator of b c forty five 
was but the debauched young demagogue of b c seventy grown older riper and more wary those who represent him as a staid and divine figure replete with schemes for the benefit of humanity need to be reminded that at the age of fifty-four in the year of the victory of pharsalus he was ready to lapse into undignified amours with a clever and worthless little egyptian princess it is worse still that two years later aged fifty-six he could condescend to write and publish his anti cato to pen a satire and a poor satire at that on an honest and worthy enemy whose ashes were hardly yet cold was worthy of a second-rate society journalist the monarch of the world was at bottom the same man as the clever young scamp whose epigrams and adulteries had scandalized rome thirty years back to understand caesar as a whole we must look not merely at the wonderful military and administrative achievements of the last fifteen years of his life but at the record of his chequered and turbulent political career from b c seventy to b c fifty eight when he was posing as the hereditary chief of the democratic party and winning his first start in political importance by his talent for self-advertisement and the management of mobs the julii were among the most ancient and by their own showing they were far the most ancient of all the old patrician houses there had been consuls of their name in the first century of the republic and when it grew fashionable to construct an elaborate family tree going back to the days before romulus the julii connected themselves with aeneas asserting that Ulysses was an alias of ascanius the eldest son of the trojan hero they worshipped as their family patroness venus genetrix a circumstance which may either have been the cause or the result of their claim to be descended from aeneas and his divine mother remembering that virgil's aeneid was one of the remote consequences of the construction of this ambitious pedigree we must be grateful to the domestic mythographer of the julii the name caesar crops up for the first time in the third century before christ from b c two o eight onward there had been a long and not undistinguished succession of consuls and praetors in the house none of them won a reputation of the first class but many had been well-known figures in their day we may especially note gaius caesar the orator a contemporary of sulla and lucius caesar who gave his name to the famous law which enfranchised the italians in b c ninety the greatest of the house did not descend from either of these men but came from a younger branch his father was by no means a notable personage though he attained the praetorship of his grandfather nothing is known but his name the julii had for the most part adhered to the optimate faction as befitted a family of such ancient descent three of them had perished in the massacres of cinna but gaius the father of the dictator would seem not to have shared the family views we find him living quietly under the democratic regime of b c eighty seven to eighty four and his sister julia had been married to no less a person than marius himself a fact which may have gone far to determine her brother's politics the connection had at any rate a lasting influence on the career of caesar himself his fierce old uncle by marriage took an interest in the lad and caused him to be made flamen dialis in the year of the great massacre although having been born in b c one o two he was at that time only fifteen years of age the flamen's cap came to him from the brows of the virtuous cornelius merula one of the countless victims of marius's reign of terror it should surely have brought ill luck to the boy but caesar till he came to the fatal ides of march was the child of fortune he escaped in the evil day when sulla came back from greece in b c eighty three to avenge the murdered optimates his youth saved him he was but nineteen and though he was the nephew of marius and had married the daughter of cinna sulla let him live this was all the more astounding because the lad had refused to divorce his wife a course which had been dictated to him as necessary to propitiate the conqueror indeed 
Caesar had to go into hiding for some time till influential relatives begged him off. But we may probably dismiss as a fiction the tale that Sulla, while he spared him, muttered to his friends that in this loose boy there were the makings of many Marii. The story bears on its face every mark of having been forged long after, when Caesar had already grown to greatness. If Sulla had really supposed that the lad was dangerous, he was far too conscientious a party man to have spared him. All that Caesar suffered at the hands of the reaction was the loss of his priesthood and that of his wife's large fortune. For the property of Cinna, like that of the other democratic leaders, was forfeited to the treasury. We know little of Caesar's life for the next few years. He was still very young, and politics in the early days of the sullen regime were dangerous. Indeed, he would seem to have left Rome in order to keep out of the dictator's notice. We find him serving in B.C. 80 through 79 under Minucius Termus at the siege of Mytilene, where he gained distinction by saving the life of one of his comrades and was rewarded by a civic crown if suetonius ever greedy after scandals is to be believed he also won attention in asia in another and a less creditable way by his licentious private life when sulla died caesar returned to rome but it is noteworthy that he is not said to have taken any part in the agitation set on foot after the dictator's death by that heady and incapable lepidus the rising was fatal to all of the surviving democrats who were rash enough to entrust their fate to such an imbecile leader but caesar was not found among them we hear of him as taking his first steps in political life in the year after the fall of lepidus when he prosecuted the proconsul gnaeus dolabella one of the old sullen gang for maladministration in macedonia but the senatorial judges acquitted him as they also did Gaius Antonius Herbrida, another and a more disreputable member of the same ring, when Caesar impeached him in the following year. This notorious ruffian was destined to survive and to take a prominent part thirteen years later, first as the associate and then as the betrayer of Catiline. It was a good advertisement for a young man of decidedly democratic antecedents to be able to accuse such persons even if he could not get them convicted. In B.C. 77 to 76, the optimates were still so much in the ascendant that it was something even to dare to attack them. After the trial of Antonius, his young accuser went off again to the east. It is said that he had not been satisfied with his own speeches, and that he was determined before resuming his political career to learn all the tricks of the orator's trade. With this object, he sailed for Rhodes, where he intended to study under the celebrated rhetorician Apollonius Molon, who had also been one of the instructors of Cicero. But these years were the golden age of piracy in the Levant, and as Caesar sailed by the island of Pharmacusa off the Ionian coast, his galley was captured by a Cilician corsair. The whole tale of his captivity is told by Plutarch and Suetonius is too full of characteristic traits of the young man to be omitted the pirates who were business-like persons bent on ransom and not on massacre took stock of their prisoner and rated him at twenty talents about five thousand pounds of our money caesar professed to be deeply hurt at being valued at such a small sum and said that he was well worth fifty talents this was a kind of captive to whom the Cilicians were unaccustomed and they eagerly accepted him at his own valuation and let his companions and freedmen depart to miletus to raise the money caesar remained alone at their headquarters accompanied only by his physician and two valets he lived among the pirates for thirty-eight days says plutarch treating them as if they had been his bodyguard instead of his jailers he used to send out whenever he wished to take his siesta and order them to keep quiet fearless and secure he joined in their diversions and took his exercise among them he wrote poems and orations and rehearsed them to the gang and when they expressed too little admiration he called them blockheads and barbarians he would often tell them in a jesting manner 
that when he should be liberated he intended to come back and crucify them all a threat which they took as a piece of playful humour on the part of this affable young gentleman but he was speaking in perfect candour the moment that the fifty talents of ransom money had been paid he hired a few galleys at miletus and ran out to look for his late captors he found them still at pharmacusa celebrating their stroke of luck by a great carouse he surprised them captured the whole gang and recovered his money intact he then took them to pergamus to hand them over for execution to junius the governor of asia but learning that the worthy magistrate had an itching palm and would probably let off the solicitors for a bribe he proceeded to put them to death on his own responsibility he crucified the whole of the late audience of his poems and orations after having first as a special favour cut their throats before he affixed them to the cross caesar then resumed his interrupted voyage to rhodes and studied rhetoric with apollonius for some months his stay in the island was brought to an end by the news that one of the generals of mithridates had invaded proconsular asia he sailed to the mainland raised some levies at his own expense and soon expelled from the province the raiding cavalry of the pontic king b c seventy four at this moment he received letters from italy informing him that he had been elected a pontifex in the place of his deceased uncle gaius aurelius cotta he returned at once to rome to take up this not unimportant religious office how such a comparatively unknown young man came to be elected to it and that too in his absence our authorities do not tell us from his return to rome b c seventy three down to the time of his praetorship in b c sixty two caesar was gradually working himself up from a position of comparative insignificance to that of the managing director of the democratic party how popularity with the urban multitude was achieved in the last days of the roman republic we know only too well the days were long past when the favour of the citizens could be won by fluent oratory and noble sentiments alone the would-be demagogue had not only to tickle the ear of the sovereign people with his harangues he had to be continually slipping bribes into its eager palm and filling its insatiable belly with doles and distributions of corn the age of tiberius gracchus was long past saturninus and sulpicius were the heroes and martyrs whom the democratic party regretted clodius was looming in the not far distant future dazzled by the magnificent career of caesar in his middle age many writers have striven to represent him as an enlightened statesman and a true lover of rome even of the world at large in his youth it is difficult to support any such theory from the facts of his early years of political activity it must be confessed that he appears as a demagogue of the usual type if he had died in b c sixty two he would be dimly remembered in history as a second glaucia whose wit was less vulgar than that of his model as the legitimate successor of sulpicius and the natural predecessor of clodius he fought with the common weapons and with the usual methods of other popular leaders of his day we perpetually hear of him as organizing and leading down to the forum or the campus martius gangs of armed rabble he broke up assemblies or overawed them with the stones and bludgeons of his satellites he swept the streets and fought on equal terms with the hired bands of the optimates he was the ally and assistant of gabinius and manilius in all their turbulent proceedings in sixty seven and b c sixty six it was his gangs which supported the stupid metellus nepos in b c sixty two and bruised and battered the bellicose cato worst of all he was more than suspected of having been deeply engaged in the catilinarian conspiracy at least in its earlier stages not one but many authors tell us that in the plot of b c sixty six caesar and catiline had joined their bands for the coup d'etat which was to make crassus dictator and caesar his master of the horse why the outbreak never took place is explained to us in half a dozen different versions 
one of which says that it was caesar not catiline who failed at the critical moment to give the signal for the rioting to commence whatever may have been the exact truth at the bottom of the many floating rumours which have survived it is certain that rightly or wrongly caesar was regarded as having been even more deeply implicated than crassus in the obscure plots of b c sixty six to sixty three we may guess that he ceased to be an active mover in them only when he discovered the full scope of catiline's designs and realized that he was too reckless and violent to make a safe coadjutor those modern writers who urge that it is improbable that the two men could ever have acted in concert use as their main arguments two very weak pleas the first is that caesar was too magnanimous and patriotic to have joined in a conspiracy which involved treason and massacre the second is that catiline was such a notorious criminal and ruffian that no sensible man with a career before him would have compromised himself by taking such a partner but the first argument is wanting in historical perspective caesar the demagogue of b c sixty six was a very different person from caesar the dictator of b c forty eight we must not argue back from his last stage to his first an ambitious young man with his way to make in the world may well have contemplated things which would not have commended themselves to the statesman who twenty years later had fought his way to supreme power the second argument that catiline was frankly impossible as a colleague falls to the ground before the fact that the respectable cicero was in b c sixty four only too eager to secure him as a friend and ally what cicero desired may well have commended itself to the more adventurous caesar evidence as to good or bad character is as useless in the one case as in the other caesar as a popular demagogue must have rubbed elbows with so many strange people between b c seventy three and sixty that we shall not easily believe that he drew the line above catiline's name indeed it would be useless to pretend that caesar paid any particular attention during his early years to the reputation of his associates or indeed to his own his way of life did not resemble that of the blameless tiberius gracchus or the priggish livius drusus he had rather borrowed his manners and morals from sulla he was anything rather than an austere fanatic or a model of all the virtues romans of the old school detested him for his absurd fastidiousness in dress the long fringes of his toga the breadth of his purple stripe and the peculiar loose style in which he girt himself displeased them they sneered at his exquisite care over his toilet his barber not only shaved him but finished him off with tongs and tweezers when an early baldness came upon him every art of the hairdresser was employed to hide the growing deformity cicero once observed that it had been long before he had taken seriously or dreaded as an enemy of the state the man who could spend so much time and thought over his personal appearance in his latter days it was remarked nothing pleased him so much of all the honours which were heaped upon him as the grant of the laurel crown which served to hide the disappearance of his once abundant locks but caesar was much more than an exquisite it is doubtful whether his recklessness in money affairs or his promiscuous amours were the more displeasing to those of his contemporaries who still loved the old roman virtues of all the rakes of rome he was by far the most notorious his admirers who plead that his life was perhaps lax according to our notions but within the bounds set up by the age in which he lived are grossly understating his reputation he was so to speak the inevitable correspondent in every fashionable divorce no household was sacred to him the elder curio called him in one of his orations omnia mulierum virum when we look at the list of the ladies whose names are linked with his in the pages of suetonius we can only wonder at the state of society in rome which permitted him to survive unscathed to middle age the marvel is that he did not end in some dark corner with a dagger between his ribs long before he attained the age of thirty the romans did not fight duels but they understood the use of the assassin for the writing of domestic scandals it is strange that none of the injured husbands named by our historians took advantage of the fact that bravos were to be hired on moderate terms in every quarter of the suburra 
but caesar lived on and his reputation seems to have been a source of peculiar pride to his satellites when he entered rome in triumph his veterans sang behind him a lewd song with the burden urbani servata uxores cava moeca matucimus these are certainly odd beginnings for a saviour of society unfortunately the end was even as the commencement there were scandals in gaul and even cleopatra had a successor in the last years of the old dictator's life you know we the wife of bogut the moor it is grotesque to have to remember that in spite of his own career he was the author of the famous dictum that caesar's wife must be above suspicion if there was any other point of caesar's character even more strongly marked than his licentiousness it was his power of getting through money especially other people's money there was only one thing in which he was economical his eating and drinking for he was free from the very common roman vice of gluttony but in everything else his expenditures were reckless he did not like crassus merely spend money on politics with the definite aim of getting on in the world much of his waste was on mere personal luxury furniture plate gems jewellery pictures slaves of distinguished appearance or accomplishments he never could resist he once but this was in his later days gave a lady friend a pearl which he had bought for six million sesterces sixty thousand pounds of our money as an example of his recklessness we are told that long before he had got to the front in politics and while he was still overwhelmed with debts he built himself a villa at orisha at great cost when it was finished he found that there was something about its architecture that he did not like and had it pulled down to the very foundation stone End of section twenty five Section twenty six of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter nine Caesar, part two. But it was, after all, on politics that Caesar threw away the greater part of his money. He had worked through all his private fortune before he had reached the age of twenty four when he entered on his quaestorship he was already thirteen hundred talents in debt and it was not until ten years after that he was in a position to pay off what he owed by that time he had exhausted other lenders and was depending on the inexhaustible purse of crassus alone the millionaire had picked him out from among all the other young demagogues of rome and had been so much struck with his ready ability and boundless self-confidence that he was prepared in return for political services to finance him to any extent the greater part of the money which caesar ran through was lavished on the most useless and extravagant bribes to the multitude he was determined to surpass all who had ever lived before him in self-advertisement when he held the idleship three hundred and twenty pairs of gladiators died for the amusement of the mob he spent countless sums in theatrical exhibitions processions and entertainments of the public at free dinners which cast into the shade even crassus's great open-air banquets of b c seventy the more useless and extravagant was his outlay the better the urban multitude was pleased after this one begins to understand the freaks of caligula and other descendants of the caesarian family but the wild extravagance caught the popular eye and was much more admired than the magnificent porticos which he built to the capital or the great basilica julia which he erected for the improvement of the sittings of the law courts the art of self-advertisement in short caesar possessed to the highest degree even when he had the misfortune to lose near relatives their funerals served him as a means for providing the people with a splendid show when his aged aunt julia the widow of marius died he took the opportunity of startling the assembled multitude by parading before them the long forbidden effigy of the old lady's deceased husband to the joy of all democrats a fragment of caesar's funeral oration over julia has been preserved by suetonius 
it is very characteristic as showing that the affectionate nephew knew how to speak one word for his respected aunt and two for himself on the mother's side he said julia descended from the ancient kings on the fathers from the immortal gods themselves for her mother and my grandmother marcia descended from ancus martius the fourth king of rome while we of the julian house trace back our origin to venus herself in our family therefore we combine the divine right of kings who are the greatest among men and the worship of the gods to whose powers even kings must bow what could be more flattering to the sovereign people than to see a gentleman of such illustrious descent courting their approval the mob it is said loves a lord how much more must it love a suitor who was as he carefully pointed out to them not merely of noble but of divine descent another funeral oration of this same sort was made by caesar over his second wife cornelia in earlier days we are told only ancient matrons were honoured with a public funeral and a laudation from the rostra he first broke through the custom by celebrating the show for a spouse who had not yet passed her prime this contributed says plutarch to fix him in the affections of the people who sympathised with him and considered him as a man of feeling and one who had his social duties at heart they must have been disappointed when he divorced instead of burying his third wife pompeia after the scandal concerning the mysteries of the bonadea caesar then was from his earliest entrance into politics working for the definite end of achieving greatness but what sort of greatness he can hardly himself have realized certainly he may be excused from holding with mommsen that he had recognized within his breast the promptings of a kingly heart and was determined to be a king that development belongs to a much later date yet there can be no doubt that his aim was always to get to the front every one knows how he wept when he looked upon the statue of alexander the great and muttered that the macedonian had conquered the whole east before reaching the age at which he himself had merely obtained the quaestorship it was a few years later that passing on his journey to spain through a miserable village in the alps he exclaimed to his travelling companions that he would rather be the first man there than the second man in rome but it seems clear that caesar in his early days was set on reaching political greatness rather by the dusty and dirty path through the forum than by the road through the battlefield by which he was ultimately destined to come to the front he was determined to be the first man in rome but till he discovered late in life that he chanced to be a military genius he intended to rise by the aid of the reeking multitude of the Sabura. the democratic party had hitherto been led by a dynasty of failures he would provide it with a chief who had none of the weak points of his predecessors he would be a gracchus who should be neither austere nor impracticable a drusus destitute of priggishness a glaucia whose jokes should always be in good taste a saturninus whose riots should always be interesting so as not to end in boring the public opinion of the streets by mere commonplace repetitions of club law and arson all this he became yet he felt when he had achieved this particular form of greatness that there was still something wanting it was unsatisfactory to remember that all his largesses had to come out of the pocket of crassus and that he might at any moment be given some dirty job by the stolid millionaire and be unable to refuse it still more tiresome must it have been to realize as caesar did realize without a doubt that an end might be put to all his games on the day when pompey should be provoked to throw his sword into the balance none knew better the powerlessness of a mob against an army one of the most striking recollections of his boyhood must have been that of the bloody day when sulla's legions cleared the gangs of sulpicius rufus out of the streets and came first of all roman soldiers armed and triumphant to the forum and the capitol there must have been a moment its date we cannot dare to fix when caesar finally came to the conclusion that the domination which he had achieved in the streets 
would avail him nothing if ever swords were drawn when once he had realized the fact his mind must have been turned to the only possible alternative had he within himself the makings of a great general that he had a soldier's courage and readiness he had proved in mytilene in b c seventy nine and in asia in b c seventy four that he could assert a personal ascendancy over his followers he knew well from his experiences during ten years of mob management but a man may be a good fighter and an inspiring leader and yet lack the main qualities of generalship caesar like other young romans of his class had undoubtedly studied the theory of the art of war from the popular greek manuals then in vogue but so had many an incapable optimate who had disgraced himself on the battlefield it yet remained to be seen whether he possessed any real military ability this could only be learnt by experiment the first occasion on which caesar had the opportunity of trying his hand at the game of war upon a considerable scale was when he went to spain as pro praetor in b c sixty one this governorship was the turning point in his whole career his contemporaries supposed that it was important to him merely because it gave him the chance of paying off the enormous debts which hung round his neck like a millstone and had made him the tool of crassus this no doubt had some weight in caesar's eyes it is certain that by some wonderful tour de force he wrung vast sums out of spain without earning a specially bad name for rapacity but a roman governor of those days had to emulate the exploits of verres and antonius if he wished to shock the public opinion of his contemporaries there can be no doubt that caesar must have shorn the spaniards close to raise the money that paid off his debts but probably as the irish wit wrote of lord carteret he had a more genteel manner of binding their chains than most of his predecessors a considerable part of the sum too was secured by the selling as slaves of his numerous prisoners of war an obvious method of money-making on which the successful commander could always rely but the financial importance of caesar's spanish governorship was nothing in comparison with its military importance for the first time he found himself at the head of a considerable army he took over two legions and raised a third and able to deal with it as he pleased nor were enemies wanting never since the spanish provinces had been formed had border warfare ceased on their northwestern frontiers the Gallici and cantabrians still maintained their freedom in their hills and many of the northern lusitanians were practically independent though nominally included within the borders of the empire even if caesar had not been wishing to try his fortune as a soldier he would have been compelled to chastise these fierce hillmen for their perpetual raids into the more settled districts but he was only too eager to discover his real possibilities in the military sphere he carried out a long and difficult campaign in the valleys of the lower duro mondego and the mino with complete success showing an untiring watchfulness and a wary skill that must have surprised his soldiery who knew him only as the hero of the roman streets it must have been in this galician and lusitanian campaign of b c sixty one that caesar came to know himself and to recognize that he was capable of the highest things in the field it must have been a stirring moment for it changed the whole of the outlook of his life he need no longer make it his loftiest aim to be the king of the suburra and the hero and model of the young rakes of rome he might now aspire to beat pompey on his own lines if he could obtain a great military province and raise a large army he might hope to achieve a more splendid reputation than that of the conqueror of the pirates and of mithridates there would be no need to shed futile tears again before the statue of alexander the great he might after all make up for the years lost in demagogy and in evil living at forty-one years of age it is still not too late to start on the soldier's trade though there is hardly another case in history save oliver cromwell of a general who discovered his avocation when so far advanced in middle life endowed with a splendid physique 
which had not been ruined even by the twenty ill-spent years of his roman career caesar was still wiry alert and untiring probably the one virtue of his youth his contempt for the delights of the cup and the platter now stood him in good stead he could march and starve with the sturdiest of his own legionaries there seemed to be no danger that his body would fail him and his mind was at its best the readiness and ingenuity which he had always displayed in the tactics of the forum were easily transferred to the tactics of the field the power of inspiring confidence which had enabled him to discipline even the demoralized city mob served him still better with the simple soldiery indeed it must have been a comparatively easy task to manage the conscripts of the spanish or the cisalpine province after managing the unruly and untrustworthy denizens of the roman slums we cannot doubt that caesar returned to rome in b c sixty with one desire before his eyes that of obtaining first the consulate and then as proconsul a military province of the first class the gauls for choice since there he would both remain comparatively near to italy and also have a splendid field for operations and a great recruiting ground it was fortunate for him that the change in his outlook on life which had resulted from his spanish campaign was not apparent to his contemporaries to pompey and crassus no less than to cicero and cato he was still the rakish demagogue of the past twenty years had crassus guessed that his late debtor the manager for many a day of his hirelings was aspiring to climb to greatness over the pile of his money-bags had pompey known that the man who offered to deliver him from the insults of the senate was intending to supersede him in the position of rome's greatest general there would have been no first triumvirate but the change in caesar's character and designs was hidden from them they allied themselves as they supposed with a mob manager of genius who undertook to clear the streets for them and to work the machinery of the comitia there was little in caesar's conduct in b c sixty to fifty nine to make them suspect that they were giving themselves a master when they acquiesced in the bargain he was to secure them what they desired and they in return were to concede to him the consulship and the gallic provinces the combination of caesar's management and crassus's money carried all before it and the consulate was duly secured to the democratic candidate in older days it would have been a serious drawback that he failed to carry the election of lucius lucaeus the obscure person who ran with him and that he was saddled with bibulus the most obstinate of optimates as his colleague but in caesar's year of office it did not matter much whether he had a colleague or not his consulship was a sort of carnival of illegality and mob law which made a fitting close to the whole of his demagogic career he violated every rule of the constitution with cheerful nonchalance that surprised even his own lieutenants he openly displayed armed men in the comitia he not only drove away the partisans of the senatorial party by force that was now the ordinary rule in domestic politics but arrested and hurried off in custody every one who dared to speak against his proposals even the respectable cato himself his crowning act of illegality took place at the passing of his agrarian law when bibulus put up three tribunes to veto it caesar quietly disregarded them and proceeded with his business the optimate consul sprang to his feet and began declaiming to the people that the whole proceedings were null and void and that his colleague was violating the most fundamental laws of the constitution caesar had him seized by his lictors bundled off the rostra and told the attendants to see that no harm happened to him and to turn him loose in some quiet street cato and the three dissentient tribunes were treated in the same unceremonious fashion then caesar bade the proceedings go on and passed his law if ever maestas the open and deliberate commission of high treason took place at rome this was the occasion a magistrate had disregarded the veto of his own colleague and of three tribunes and had finally laid violent hands on their sacrosanct persons 
and expelled them from the assembly the optimates wondered that the sky did not fall then and there but nothing happened and caesar declared his bill to be law and carried out its provisions bibulus formally summoned the senate next day narrated the indignities that he had suffered and called upon the fathers to support him in open resistance and to declare all his colleagues doings invalid he was met with a mournful silence the days of nausicaa and opimius were over no one offered to arm his clients and go forth to save the state the veterans of pompey and the mob of caesar seemed too formidable so bibulus shut himself up in his house and contented himself with posting a daily placard to the effect that he was observing the heavens and that it was therefore impossible that any legal meeting of the comitia could take place by the letter of the law he was undoubtedly right and every bill that passed during the remainder of the year b c fifty nine was null and void but what was to be done if the bills were not only carried but obeyed the wits of rome called the time the consulship of julius and of caesar in derision of the unfortunate bibulus it would have been more correct to call it not a consulship at all but a fine specimen of tyranny caesar meanwhile went on in his reckless career passing bills good bad and indifferent some of them were excellent administrative measures others such as the ratification of pompey's asiatic acta were eminently proper and justifiable others again were shameless bribes to the mob or the equites the one which struck contemporary opinion as the most objectionable was that which made a plebeian of publius clodius that detestable young man had given caesar good cause of offence by the scandal at the mysteries of the bonadia and had forced him not without reason to divorce his wife but the consul bore him no grudge indeed he seems to have regarded him with a sort of parental affection as the destined successor who was about to repeat his own early career of political riot and private debauchery clodius wished to become a plebeian in order to qualify for the tribunate caesar indulged him and proposed himself the lex curiata by which the adoption of the young man into a plebeian family was managed the ceremony was carried out in an irregular not to say a farcical fashion no sanction was procured from the pontifices the legal notice of three nundinae before the meeting of the curies was not given the adopter who undertook to make clodius his son was a lad of nineteen one publius fonteius who was far younger than clodius and unmarried yet he was made to profess his want of issue and the necessity of his adopting a son to continue his race as a matter of fact he married not long after and had many children caesar carried through the scandalous show and left clodius behind him as his agent for the due maintenance of mob law and anarchy during his absence in gaul early in b c fifty eight the moment that his turbulent consulship was over caesar hurried off to take over charge of the gallic provinces and their legions he had secured himself no mere annual governorship but a long term of five years of command such had been the purport of the vatinian law which was drafted on the same lines as the gabinian and manilian laws that had been passed for pompey's benefit nearly ten years before clearly caesar thought that five years would be required to enable him to make his name and frame his army what he was to do when his term ran out we may doubt whether he had as yet determined his spanish command had been a great experiment his gaulish one would be an even greater as yet he cannot have framed any other intention than that of being the greatest man in rome of what sort his predominance was to be he had probably formed no fixed plan all would depend on how affairs went in the land of the celts that caesar went to gaul with a fixed intention of carrying the boundaries of the empire to the rhine and the ocean there is no reason to doubt the existing frontier of the transalpine province was drawn in an illogical and haphazard fashion beyond it lay tribes in various ill-defined relations of vassalship and amity to rome ever since the cimbric campaign of marius the province had been needing and always failing to obtain the hand of a master 
but even if caesar had arrived with the most pacific intentions he would have been forced to fight before his governorship was six months old there were troubles brewing on the eastern frontier of gaul which were already becoming dangerous not only to the independent tribes but to the transalpine dominions of rome the swavian king ariovistus with a miscellaneous horde of migratory germans compacted from many races had crossed the rhine as the cimbri had crossed it fifty years before and was threatening to overrun all central gaul at the same moment the warlike helvetii were deserting their narrow and mountainous homes in switzerland with the object of conquering for themselves a more spacious and fertile abode in the valley of the rhone no proconsul however slack and indolent could have avoided interference in both these movements to caesar they were an absolute godsend as they provided him with the best possible reasons for enlarging his army and engaging in active hostilities the very moment that he reached his province the gaul and german were enemies well known to the roman soldier in marching against them caesar had none of the disadvantages which crassus had suffered when he went forth to meet the unknown tactics of the parthians the gaul indeed was one of the most familiar foes of the state the bands whom caesar fought in b c fifty eight through fifty one were precisely similar to those with whom camillus or marcellus had contended two or three centuries before their gallant but unstable hordes more than men at the first onslaught less than women after a severe repulse were precisely the sort of troops against whom the steady and untiring legion was most effective the only really dangerous part of their hosts was the cavalry formed of the chiefs and their sworn henchmen who were far superior to any mounted troops of whom caesar could dispose when first he went to gaul to withstand them he had to enlist friendlies of their own nationality and spanish mercenaries a little later germans also for the latter were found to be superior to the gauls themselves in the cavalry arm as to the tribal levies of infantry they were difficult to check at their first rush but when it was spent the individual swordsman with his immense claymore and big shield was not fit to cope either in a single-handed fencing match or in a large body with the well-trained legionary the rank and file understood this as well as caesar himself and their knowledge of the fact was no mean help to their general with the germans it was at first otherwise the roman army remembered arausio quite as well as it remembered Vercelli and had an exaggerated respect for the giants of the northern forests and their indomitable pluck at the first encounter with ariovistus caesar had many anxious moments there was a doubt whether the legions could be trusted to do their best their general acknowledges that when he marched against the germans many of his officers showed signs of malingering and the rank and file began to make their wills as if they were going forward to certain death it required a wonderful mixture of tact and firmness on the part of caesar to induce his troops to make their first attack on ariovistus but when the feat was accomplished the legionary discovered that the teuton was if bigger and fiercer yet even more undisciplined and clumsy than the celt and far worse armed the german tribes even a century later had hardly got to the stage of wearing armour or forming an orderly battle array yet both gaul and german were enemies not to be despised and it was no ordinary general who could have set out with a light heart for the deliberate purpose of attacking them in order to win a great military reputation at their expense nothing but an ever-pressing unconquerable ambition could have driven caesar to the taking up of such a formidable task End of section twenty six